You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Uh, how's everyone doing tonight? Let me know what everyone's thoughts are on the weekend. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to the Richmond Expo. We uh, we signed the I's, dotted the T's. Uh, Fishing the DMV is going down to the Richmond Expo to be able to do to bring you all the content we possibly can. We're going to have a podcast at least one of those days. We're going to be doing podcasting all day. And then just like at iCast, we're going to go to booth to booth and we're going to interview as many people as humanly possible. So I wanted to have some fun news to debut today and that's it. We are going to go to iCast. So pretty pumped about that. Uh, the podcast will begin next week. I am doing some editing. Uh, I have a hidden gems episode that should be dropping here either this week or next. So I'm really kind of get, get, get that edited up for you guys. But next Tuesday, the next podcast episode drops and then we'll be back on schedule for that as well. So tonight, yeah, I just wanted to hang out with you guys a little bit, see how everyone's uh, Christmas and New Year's went. Maybe some some people in the chat, let me know if you've already caught your first fish of 2023. You know, put F in the chat if you already caught a, caught a fish or, and put an X in the chat if you haven't had a chance to get out yet. I am lucky that I actually did pop that cherry and I got my first fish of the year yesterday. I got several, including, um, well, I got to save that because that's going to become a video. That's, that's a Hidden Gems episode that's going to be dropping. But we caught some really, really good good ones. Chris Sherwood, X in the chat. He hasn't caught one yet. Uh, I'm sorry, bud. Phil, X in the chat. We got J Hey, there we go. Jesse already got a fish for 2023. Congratulations. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, guys, this is a great time of year to be out there. You, whether you're pond fishing, river fishing, lake fishing, you usually have it to yourself, which is absolutely awesome. You're able to get out there, have some privacy, and enjoy it. We got Greg Plank, an 18-inch smallie on the Susquehanna. Dude, that is an absolute toad. Um, that's an absolute toad. Jess, Mega Bass 110 Junior got him. And that kind of gets us into today's thing. Um, we are talking jerk baits. We're talking all things jerk bait. I thought this was kind of important. I went out to shoot a hidden gems episode and one of the big bites people that supposedly was going to be happening is a jerk bait bite in the winter time. And so going into that day, knowing that I brought all of my jerk bait stuff with me, uh, we ended up having an absolute fun time, but really that, that time really taught me the importance of being able to adapt and not just stick with one thing the whole time. Um, and that's what we're going to be getting into today. Scott Klein, I ended the year with a bang, three citation walleyes, one of them 12.14 pounds. Well done, sir. Scott, that's freaking awesome. That's really awesome. Um, we're going to have a little preview at the end of tonight for the Hidden Gems episode as well. So stay tuned for that at the end. That, dude, that's an awesome way to end the year. I really like that. Um, but anyway, let's get into it. Jerk baits. So winter time, and especially going into that spring, is a absolutely fantastic time to be throwing a jerk bait, especially if you are a river angler for smallmouth. Now, I'm going to be going down through all the baits, all the colors I like, how I like to experiment with them, and maybe a couple other little little tips and tricks that might be able to help you guys out. Maybe it's something you guys already do. So when it comes to jerk bait fishing, it's it's super duper easy. All you got to do is match the color. That's basically it. Uh, no, it's a lot. It's a lot more complicated than that. The two things you want to look at, I think, the, the two most important things is the depth of your bait and the color for the draw factor. Okay. So number one, let's go with depth of the bait, and let's go with let's go with this shad wrap right here, small bill, and then let's go with ah, uh, let's go with this lucky craft deep diver. Okay. When are you going to throw which one? The key with a jerk bait, no matter the bill size, is you want it just above the fish's head. You think, well, Tom, is it that simple? Absolutely. The problem is the depth of water you're dealing with. If you are dealing with four feet of water that's gin clear, a shad wrap like this might be all you need. If you are dealing with super duper cold 30 feet of water and those fish are 10 feet off the bottom, you're going to have to go with a deeper diving bill. I know this is the boring stuff, guys. Don't worry. We're going to be getting into the more important stuff here in a minute. But what you might be thinking, though, is let me pull this one back up here. Here we go. So 
with that said, the key with the jerk baits to be able to be successful and be able to put more fish in the boat than anyone else is your ability to not stay married to a bait and to adapt and change. Uh, when we went out the other day, when I was when I was shooting, when I was filming, I had on my jerk bait rod. I had on my clamp, which we'll talk about too, so I could quickly switch baits. And once we got into an area where we thought the fish should be, I didn't give it too long with each bait. I usually gave it about 10 casts in an area before I'd make a switch. And so what we found out real quickly for the jerkbait fish was we had to go to a deeper diving bill. Now we were on a river system. The water wasn't super deep in these pools we were fishing, but they were not willing to, in the early part of the day, they chased this one right here with that shorter diving bill. So we went to a little bit deeper diver in the same water. And that was the ticket. How did we, how did I know that that, to do that versus changing the color, for example. Well, the first thing I did is I, I went and I changed color 100%. I started with a neutral color and I worked to a more bold color with no results. And then I cycled back through to the deeper diving bill and I got bit. And that is the biggest takeaway with anything you're doing jerkbait wise is to constantly change and adapt, change and adapt. Um, color wise, let's get into color wise because this is, this is first and foremost, the most important thing. When you're jerkbait fishing, you have got to have a multitude of colors. And I know you guys can kind of see off to my right here. I have picked generically kind of all the colors that you really need and the sizes that you really need to get successful. And then I'm going to say this with a caveat. If you are an angler that's starting out and you are on a budget, do not feel like you have to get the mega bass, the visions, things of that, that ilk. Okay. Why? Because if you have only, you know, Ten dollars, twenty dollars to your name. Let's just say, let's say you got you got twenty bucks. You can get. Let me go find it here. You can get this KVD Strike King jerk bait right here. You can get two or three of them for the price of a Vision One Ten or a Vision, you know, Long Pointer Vision Junior. Uh, like again, I love Vision. I have a bunch of them, but I'm just trying to give a budget friendly option too as we go on tonight. And the fact that colors are so important. If I only have one color of my Vision 110 on the boat, even though this is the best quality jerkbait imaginable, if they're not dialed into that color, I'm going to have a lot of issues with it. So keep that in mind. If your budget allows you to get all these colors in Mega Bass, perfect. Don't worry about this. Anyway, color-wise. So generally speaking, when I start out fishing, I'm going to go with, at this time of year, I'm, let's say we're dealing with uh, clear water, partly sunny, light ripple on the water. I'm going to be going with my bone style colors to begin with, that white bone. And what I'm looking for is when I put this thing in the water, if it almost has a glow to it. So if the water conditions are perfect and I stick this thing in the water, you should be able to see it glow or have an aura around it. If you see that, those are the perfect conditions to start out with that bone style color. It's going to have the best silhouette, it's going to get you the most bites, generally speaking. So then from there, you're going to be able to have some draw factor with it. And then this is where the deviation does, where you can fine tune this bite. Okay. And let's just say, let's start with, let's start with small mouth on, on the Shenandoah river. Let's just go with that. So if I'm starting out with, with this deep diving jackal, sexy shad bone color here, I'm getting a couple of fish to commit. I'm seeing a lot of chasers on the live scope, but they're not committing to it. Okay. But the water still is pretty clear. I'm going to go from the bone and I'm going to go to a more translucent color right here. Oop, wrong one. This right here is a Strike King 200 series. Absolutely see-through. It's extremely, extremely transparent. I don't know if you guys can see that on screen. Extremely transparent. So if I'm dealing with that clean water and I'm already getting the followers, the first thing I'm going to change to is a more neutral colored bait like this one here. You can also do the same thing with the Mega Bass. If I'm dealing with stained water, this is important, with a slight chalkiness, I'm going to say it's, it's chalk, not mud. Okay. I'm going to go to gold. Gold, as you can see here on this Lucky Craft version, that's Lucky Craft uh, black and gold. It has a really good light refraction in the water. So a little bit of chalk to it. And I'm going to go with this cloud cover. This is going to get a little bit more flash and it's going to be able to get more drawing power. Also, if I am fishing where you have perch or shiners, so example is if I go to Florida, I'm going to be throwing a gold colored jerk bait 
uh, probably is my primary color. This right here will get absolutely smoked in Florida for some reason. And again, it's, it's probably because of the shiners. So move, food for thought there. Now, from there, let me get you here. And there's like a couple of gold patterns you, you can go with. If I have, where, where is that color? Oh, here it is. If I have super clear water, but I also have a lot of wind action, I'm going to go with gold. The brightest gold color you can possibly get, gold and chrome. Gold, or I'm sorry, gold. I'm, I'm an idiot. The, <laughs> the brightest chrome silver color I can possibly get away with. And then as you can see on this one, I added a blade to it as well. This will really get that thing to flash and strobe in the water column to really draw them in. And then, so those are the basic colors. You're going to bone, bright silver, gold, and then you're going to do completely translucent. Now, from there, we're going to go down the rabbit hole even more, and we're going to get into very niche colors. So example is, let me find her right here. These right here are two of my favorite colors for smallmouth up at Lake Chautauqua, Lake Champlain, anywhere they have perch. Um, and then also, guys, here's spoiler. This works really good for tidal Potomac uh, River largemouth as well. This gold and yellow color is absolutely just murder when they're hitting perch. And then I'll also use a little bit of chartreuse too on smallmouth, but I would go more with this, the mega bass. If you color, this one is my favorite with chartreuse. And I'll link this guys on the upload, all these colors too, by the way. If I'm fishing Lake Anna and I'm fishing super clear water down by the dam, if I'm at Lake Hartwell, Lake Kiwi, places like that, you want to get something with a blue tinge on the top to it, or you can go with a black and blue gold. And the reason is because you have to dial in on that blue back bite. And so as you can tell here, like there are so many avenues that you can go with the colors. And this is why I'm so, so I, I beat this over the head to all the young kids I talk to, you know, a jerk bait is definitely a bait. It's not like a chatter bait or a black and blue jig. It's just like, you just roll in with one color. You have to be willing to adapt and switch and switch and switch. And then this is where I think this comes really important. This is where I think this comes extremely in handy is a snap swivel. So this right here is a, this one's made by Strike King. Make sure you guys can see it right there. This is a quick attach snap swivel. And what I love about this when I'm pre-practicing, when I'm trying to dial in a bite is I can, I can super quickly switch it out. Boom. I'm locked in like that. And that's all it does. It just, it just uses pressure. Boom. I'm off. And then this is how I'm able to cycle through color so much faster. Instead of having to tie whatever your knot of choice is, again, 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 cut and retie. When I'm pre-practicing with my partner, with my brother, or alone, or I'm trying to dial in the bite, I always start with a snap swivel. That way I can quickly cycle through everything that I'm doing. Then if I get the color dialed in, okay, this is probably what I'm going to be throwing. If you want, you can cut this off and then tie straight to the bait. However, just starting with this thing, snapping it on snapping it off dude it is going to make your life so much freaking easier uh again uh, i'll link this this specific one in the comment section uh down below but this one right here is made by striking it's the one i really like but there's a ton of really good companies out there it will save you so much time and make you feel way more efficient when it comes to cycling through your colors so give that a try now i'm gonna try oh i got some ton of questions here hold on let me get some questions to answer here uh Matthew, I'm you using live scope. So for this last fishing um, shindig, I was not, the guy did not have live scope in his boat. I do, I have used live scope a bunch um, before. It's really nice to help you cycle through colors to be able to see how those fish are positioned. And besides seeing if they're going to commit to your bait or not, the thing that's super nice about live scope is it can take and sh I'm sorry, sorry, messages, ton of messages. I almost need somebody like filter through these for me. Um, What's so nice about live scope, besides seeing whether the fish is going to commit to the bait or not, is to see where they are in the water column to begin with. It is so much, it's so easy. It really is. It cuts down the learning curve so much. When you can go there and you can fan over a point and see the fish are sitting, you know, 10 feet off the bottom and 30 feet of water, and probably like, okay, I'm going to have to go with a deeper diver. Or you can see that they're higher up in the water column. Like, okay, I could probably get them with a regular di diving jerk bait. So that's the really nice thing with live scope. But you don't need live scope. And honestly, the jerk bait in of itself is, it was the first bait besides maybe like a glide bait that 
that will pull fish and kind of act like live scope. So example, if you're fishing like a spotted bass reservoir and you go with, you know, a gold, silver, and chrome bait like this one here, and you start jerking this thing around docks, you're going to pull a ton of fish out of there. Whether you catch them or not, I don't, I don't know, but you're going to pull them and see them waypoint and you can come back. So if you don't have live scope on your boat, a jerk bait is a fantastic way to, to cover some water, figure out where the fish are positioned, and then go back through there and really be thorough. Let's see. We got Chris Sherwood. Can you show that snap? I'll do you one better, sir. Hold on one second. You know what I will do? I'm going to pull this up on the old online so I can show it to you a little bit better. I don't know, dead time. People don't like it, like when it's just dead time. But no, like people don't use snaps and it's just so weird. And I think it's because like when you grow up, you're told not to use snaps, but snaps have gotten so much better nowadays than when they were when we were kids. And it makes it so much easier to quickly adjust your bait to be able to switch from one bait to the other. Um, and, and there's like, like I said, there's like a ton of brands out there and you can go online, you can find them. Let me go with uh, this one right here. So then here you go, bud. So this one right here is made by Mustang. And I'll bring this up on screen. So this one right here is the Mustad. This is the Mustad fast catch, fast, atch, fast atch, fast attach. Uh, Kevin Van Dam actually made this thing. It's about three bucks. You can buy it at Tackle Warehouse, Bass Pro Shop, all those fine places. Uh, th that's just one. I like it because of how easy it is. I can just quickly snap it back and forth. Uh, and then, yeah, Chris, let me know down below once you're able to see this and then I can, uh, I can get rid of the screen again. You can got, get this pretty much everywhere. I really enjoy using that thing. Yeah. God is good. And so are snaps. It, it really is. And then, oh, swim baits. If you're throwing a lot of glide baits, big swim baits, uh, a, a mag draft, something like that, getting a high quality snap gives the bait a lot more movement on your line and you can quickly adjust it. Yeah. Greg, Greg VMC is really good too. Uh, VMC has got a really good one. And again, um, you don't have to be married to the one I like, but there are a bunch out there. And I highly suggest if you're a jerkbait angler to try to start using those, it helps a lot. Let's see, Scott, I got the VMC crankbait snaps from Jake's at the Riverton seminar so far. So good. Yeah. Like honestly, as long as you match up the right size snap to what you're doing. So this snap that I have right here, the Mustang one, I would not use this with a big, you know, Huddleston swim bait or a 10 inch mag draft. That would, I, I would bend it out completely, but for a jerk bait rod and my jerk bait setup, when I'm using lighter line, I have the drag set correctly. Yeah. I'm not going to be, I'm, I won't have a problem with that. Um, and, and then drag is very important depending on how you use your jerk baits and then the line let's get into that. And then we'll get back to some of the jerk bait pieces here. Um, when you're throwing a jerk bait, Line will create drag and it'll affect how deep the bait will go and how it will position. If I am fishing the tidal Potomac river and I'm fishing a grass bed, let's say the grass bed is submerged. It's April, ah, four to five feet of water, let's say. And the grass is about, you know, a foot off the bottom, something like that. So I got some room to play with. What I'm probably going to be throwing is braid to a, monofilament leader 20 pound foot monofilament or i'm going to be going straight straight braid something like that i probably you know what probably is going to be monofilament leader in this situation has created in my head and the reason being is that bit that bigger diameter monofilament is going to float and pull it up off the bottom it's going to keep it from dying down as deep so that's number one number two going with that heavier line if i hook one with all that grass and crap there i'm going to be able to winch them out of there without an issue Bob, do you guys use spinning rods when jerkbait fishing? So yeah, we're going to get into that too. So anyway, if you're fishing super shallow water, you're trying to keep the bait up off the bottom, go with heavier monofilament. You could probably use a, a little bit heavier fluorocarbon, but the problem with fluorocarbon is fluorocarbon sinks. So if you're trying to keep that bait up off the bottom, fluorocarbon is not going to be your friend there. Going with the braid to a monofilament like shock leader really will help you get that bait up and off the bottom. Now, on the flip side, if you're trying to maximize the depth, you're fishing the Shenandoah River, someplace like that, there are two ways you can go about it. So, and Bob, this is going to kind of answer your question here. Number one, you can go with the spinning rod setup. I personally, when I use a spinning rod setup, I'm going to go with braid to my fluorocarbon leader. Uh, eight to 10 pound fluorocarbon 
is usually what I'm going to use. I get maximum casting distance and I can really bring that thing down into the water column. If I don't go that way, the other way I'm going to go is with this setup here, which is a BFS rod. As you guys know from my other live streams, I've gotten big into the BFS equipment. This is a medium light bait casting rod and I can spool up six pound test fluorocarbon. This is six pound test fluorocarbon line straight. And so the reason I do this is when I don't want to have that leader. I don't want to have a braid to fluorocarbon leader at all. I want to be able to go straight fluorocarbon and I don't have to worry about a knot and I don't have to worry about it birds nesting. If you go straight fluorocarbon on a spinning outfit, you're going to have that issue with it birds nesting or wrapping up on you. The other issue with a braid to fluorocarbon leader setup is if it's extremely windy, the braid is going to catch in the wind and it's going to pull that jerk bait and create a lot of drag. Now you can put your rod tip down if you want to, that will work perfectly fine. But this is me like just trying to experiment with, if I go pure fluorocarbon on this kind of bait casting setup. I have the ability to have super thin line, make bomb casts, and I'm not going to get the wind knots. Uh, and there's another reason I like to go with this setup, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But so that's why I, I, I go with this. Otherwise, what will work perfectly fine is to go with a spinning rod, braid, uh, 10 to 14 pound braided, braided line is your main line. And then you can go to your fluorocarbon leader. So now what is another reason you might want to go with a spinning rod versus a bait caster? A spinning rod, you will have the ability to bomb that thing 500 miles. A bait caster, you really can't. You will always be able to throw, if properly balanced, a spinning rod setup way farther than a bait caster, period. So why would you want to also throw a bait caster? Control. We talked about this uh, when we talked about the Ned Rig setup I like to throw. I have the ability with this thing here, I can stop it. So if you were fishing, let's say you're fishing uh, laydowns on the Shenandoah River, okay? You're fishing shore-based cover on the Shenandoah River in the wintertime when they're in those deep pools right next to the bank. Well, if I use a spinning rod, I'm not going to be able to thumb it and stop it very easily. And so I have a higher risk of launching that beautiful $400 mega bass right into a tree. Well, while going with this BFS setup, I can roll cast that thing and thumb it and stop it immediately. And so I can be more precise while I'm working around laydowns, docks, things of that ilk. So if you want to be more surgical and precise, a bait caster is extremely good. It gives you that level of control. If you are fishing just dead nut center of the Shenandoah and you're just bomb casting that thing as far as you want, spinning rod's good. If you're working a long point on like, let's say like Anna, Spinning rod's really good. If you're chasing blueback herring bites or, or schooling fish and you need to make those long bombarded casts, spinning rod works. And so hopefully that kind of helps you out with that. Now, I will say, move that right over there. The other thing to keep in mind is what type of jerk bait that you're going to be throwing. So example is if I am fishing, let's see, make sure I got this one here. Let's say you're fishing the Omen plus one. If I'm fishing the Omen plus one and I have a killer bite with this bad boy right here and I'm fishing Smith Mountain Lake or Lake Anna in March, let's just say, occur, name your place. And I have a chance to actually hook a you know six to seven pound largemouth. I'm probably going to want to go with a bait caster setup, a little bit heavier line just so I have better control over the fish. The reason you want to go with lighter line in general, if, if we want to make this a math equation, is you're going with lighter line to either get the bait down deeper or to get more bites. Uh, when I did that Hidden Gems episode last year at Jim Burnett Park in Winchester, I was fishing four to six pound fluorocarbon because I had to because the fish were so nervous and line shy. That was just to get bit. I don't like to fish four to six pound tests. I would prefer to fish something a little bit heavier. But those are just my, my thoughts with that. Oh, I got a question right here. Make sure I get this. Uh, what are some mega bass jerk baits and colors you use? I have none. I need to buy some. Bob, I'll give you some of mine and I'll put it in the, uh, I'll talk about them here. But also I would suggest going to Millican Fishing or Tactical Bassin as well. Um, probably not good for my channel, but let's just think, just face it. Uh, they're the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit when it comes to um, jerk baits. And they will give you a better rundown than I could ever when it comes to all the colors. But I'll give you some of mine, too, in the episode description as well. And let me actually link that video here, too. 
that tactical bassing video because that one is insanely good. Well, all their videos are good, but they have a very good in-depth color one that you could go to. Let me get that thing right here in the library. I know like people, uh, my my friends really get on me about like, why is it you uh, send people off your channel? <laughs> why do you send people off your channel and go to other channels to, uh, it's like, well, you know, you got to give the people good stuff and, you know, good information. And, you know, if that means that you got to send them away, you got to send them away. All right. And I'll put this right down here. And let me know if you guys got that. I just sent you the, the tactical bassing video. And that should be in the episode description. Let me know if, if that works for you as well. Uh, colors wise that you want to go with. You want to go with a translucent color. Uh, Bob, you want to go with a translucent color. You want to go with a bone color, sexy shad type of color here. So this is like, this is the jackal deep dive. I really, the reason I got this was I like the color scheme here. It's a sexy shad bone. It's really good. Um, Greg, mega bass is solid for sure, but they are not durable. Fish rocks break $20. Exactly. Like, again, I have a ton of mega bass. I usually only throw those on game day or, or when money's on the line. I'll go with other ones and practice stuff like that. Cause like example is, and, and I really, I really, when it comes to the color version of it, let me get you right here. If I'm trying to go with, with something like this and I need this color, I'm wrong one here. What am I doing? You know, it's been a long day. You know, if I'm on a bone color here and the depth is a thing, I'm going to go with bone. This one right here is a little bit cheaper than this one. So why not I lose this one versus the other one? That was kind of my whole point there. That was really idiotic. Uh, if you send us away and we get good information, we're going to come back. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate that. No, it's about giving you guys good stuff. And like, I know like Tactical Bass also like puts out really high quality content. Milk and Fishing puts a lot of content. I'm just kind of going down with my colors. Uh, you want a bone color. You want a silver color. You want a gold black color. Uh, and then you want a sexy shad and then uh, a sarchers. If you get a, if you get those colors there, I don't care what brand first, get all those colors, own all those colors. Once you have all those colors, then upgrade to the mega bass, the jackals, the lucky crafts. But make sure you have all those colors first. That 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 is so, so important when you're actually jerkbait fishing. Um, then what you want to get into, now that we got all those colors dialed in, let's talk about when you want to veer off. Jerkbaits go hand in hand with another bait. And this is a secret. It's won me money. I outfish people with it and nobody fishes these. So this, the other day we were fishing, uh, this stretch of river. I'll, I'll give that away. We were fishing a stretch of river and the, it was, the jerkbait bite was always on. The jerkbait bite was always on. And for some reason, the jerkbait bite died. And this guy said like, Hey, listen, this spot we're in definitely has them. They're here. For some reason, they just went off the jerkbait. I don't know why. So then I went and I tied on this secret bait of mine. This here is a spy bait. The spy bait is to a jerk bait what peanut butter and jelly or what jelly is to peanut butter. These two absolutely go hand in hand. And whenever you go out jerk bait fishing, you absolutely need to have a spy bait on. They do exactly the same thing. For the people that have gone that went to the river panel fishing seminar, Jeff green, Chris Gorsuch, Travis Eden all talked about dead sticking a jerk bait. What that means is you cast the jerk bait out and you just slowly let it drift down current, almost like a fly. And then when it gets back to the, the very back of the boat or the back of the hold pending, you hold it there and it does absolutely nothing. Do you know what that movement mimics? A spy bait. The spy bait is the absolute epiphany of subtle creeping action. When they go off the jerkbait bite and you had a hot jerkbait bite or the fish are in jerkbait areas, the first thing I'm going to go to is a spy bait. You're going to want to throw this on a braid setup, a spinning rod braid setup, 10 to 14 pound braid, and you're going to go with eight to six pound fluorocarbon. You cast it out and then you just slowly wind it back. And that thing is just gonna absolutely have a do nothing dead stick action. And what it does is it shimmies back and forth, just like that through the water column. 
Now, what I also do is I'll fish this on a BFS setup. I'll fish this on pure six pound fluorocarbon because it sinks and I like how it acts a little bit more. And so this right here is my medium light uh, BFS setup rod. This is a seven, is this my seven? Yeah, this is a seven foot BFS setup rod. I have six pound fluorocarbon, straight fluorocarbon on here. And the first cast through this hole, I hook a 17 inch smallie. First cast through there, absolutely front hook nailed. We beat that spot to hell with jerk baits. Nothing went right to this and we caught two more good ones. So the point is, if you are on a good jerk bait bite, do not be afraid to go back through there with the spy bait. The spy bait does a lot that the jerk bait does, just more subtle. Color wise, these are super easy. You're going to go with a bone, just the whitest thing you can possibly get away with. And then you're going to go with what is called. Uh, a rayu, I think, a wayu color. It's almost a translucent minnow color like that. These two right here. Now, these things are like pulling a, tr literally pulling a treble hook through the water. When you reel it in, it's going to be coming through the water like this, at this angle like that, just pulled through like this. What you don't realize though, it's super subtle. That thing is just shimmying the whole time. And all you want to do is just slowly reel that thing at the, the distance from the bottom you want it. If you want it a little bit higher in the water column, reel it a little bit faster. If you want to slow it down, get it closer to the bottom, slow down. If you really want to get really nerdy with it, go with your braid to your fluorocarbon. Take that setup, get rid of the fluorocarbon, and go to mono. I would suggest going to about to 10 to 12 pound test monofilament. And what that'll do is that I'll actually lift this bait up off the wa water, uh, the water, <laughs> lift it up off the bottom. Now, believe it or not, this little thing helped cash me a check in a BFL a long time ago. It was in the springtime and they got off the jerk bait bite that I had on a grass, on a submerged grass flat. Uh, we were throwing, everyone was throwing chatter baits. Everyone was throwing like lipless baits. Uh, I was throwing a jerk bait and a lipless bait. The bite stopped. I went to a spy bait, but this one I threw, I think it was, it was like 18 pound test, pure straight mono. I was throwing on a bait caster and I was bombing that thing out there and just slowing it, slow reeling it back to the boat. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can you use a spy bait in, in color red water in off colored water? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can use a spy bait in off colored water. You can go with a chartreuse actually, like a, a chartreuse colored spy bait as well. That one, I don't have my spy bait box actually with me. Um, I kind of last minute thought I should throw a spy bait in because it's kind of like you throw it. Honestly, what I should do is actually make a box. And it was so cool is like they have so many spy baits now. They're perch colored. Go with perch. It has chartreuse. And then I would sharpie the hell out of that one. That's that's one of the sizes I have. Um, smoke bone is the color I just showed you. And then you get super, super crazy clear colors too. Um, where's the AU? I'm thinking I'm saying that right. I want to know how to spell the damn thing. There it is. There's one on there. A, how the hell is that? A, A, Y, U, A, Y, U. I don't speak Japanese. A, A, Y, A, Y, U, whatever that, whatever that word is, that is the one that's really important. Um, I, I, I for all my Japanese listeners, I am horrifically bad at speaking American, let alone Japanese, but anyway, and you can get big spy baits too. The key is you're going to be slow reeling that you want to keep that at the level you want. Now let's go to cadence and let's go to hooks. Actually, let's flip that around. Hooks. Scott Martin, Scott Martin, Aaron Martin, finesse, gamagatsu, treble hooks, round bin. That is the only hook I have confidence in. I absolutely love it. You're going to change up all your hooks. Those hooks are insanely sticky sharp, super, super sticky sharp round bins. If they even look at the bait, they are going to get buttoned up. No problem. Those are the hooks that I I personally like. I do not like to go with triple grips for my jerk baits. I don't. Um, one reason is usually triple grips, it's a little bit harder for them to get hooked because again, a triple grip has that inward hooking barb. If you're throwing, let's say a crankbait, or if you watch my lipless videos, because that rabbit hole is going to come soon, a lipless bait, I like to actually go with triple grips. The reason is with a triple grip, or I'm sorry, with a lipless bait or a crankbait, usually what will happen in the late spring period those fish get a little bit more frisky and they tend to want to jump and throw hooks well on a 
square bill and a lipless bait that which are notorious for fish throwing hooks well if you go to that triple grip you will miss a couple of fish that just slap at the bait however in a tournament every fish that gets hooked you have a 95 percent chance that they're coming into the boat well with a jerk bait you are usually dealing with let's say with this mega bass here three sets of hooks so you really don't need to worry about that. If he gets one hook in him, generally speaking, when he's coming to the boat, you're going to get the rest of them in there. So, and because fish usually slash at these things, I really want to go with something that's super sticky and with the hooks almost facing outward or right up so you can get good connection with them. So that's important there too. The other thing to, to keep in mind with, with all these baits in the hooks is wherever you fish them, make sure you check, change out the hooks. If you're fishing a lot of rock, let's say you're fishing riprap and you're getting that bait down there banging on the bottom. This has happened to me in the past when we would go down to Lake Kiwi and we were fishing massive, just long stretches of riprap and we would bash those baits into the rock, getting them low enough for that. Because what would happen is we were bashing them on the rocks and then what happens is there's a massive drop off. So we're fishing that lip. And the bait would hit the rocks and then pop off the edge of the abyss where the spotted bass were waiting and they'd smoke them. Well, after a while, uh, yeah, the hooks would get dull and you didn't know it and you'd lose fish. You'd have to change your hooks out. Case in point, make sure you have really, really sharp hooks. Uh, let's see. Trapper keeper uh, for rattle traps I learned at the seminar. Trapper keeper, yes. Um, yeah, rattle traps are really, really good baits and, and we'll definitely, I'll do my full in-depth thing. Cause the, that there's a couple of oops, wrong way. There's a couple of trophies behind my left shoulder that basically I won with lipless baits because lipless baits still will outfish, uh, chatter baits period. Uh, they have an ability to do something that chatter baits can't. And I'll leave it at that. And when you crack that code, it unlocks a whole different style of fishing that can really help you find the winning, the winning load. Let's get into some questions here. Let's go. Chris Sherwood. Uh, what do you think of the Zuri 3Ds? Quite a quite a few of them just caught them. Just caught me. Uh, I have not tried the Zuri, but you know what I'm going to do? Because I really don't want to talk about baits I've never fished before. Uh, Zuri. I'm going to make sure I write that down. And so I will buy a couple. I'll test it out. And I'll give you an opinion. Zuri 3Ds. Zuri makes some good bait. Zuri also makes... Um, some really good lipless baits too, by the way. Greg, Cadence. Oh, yes. Let's talk about Cadence. Give it to us. Uh, what what do you, Greg, what do you want me to give to you? I'll give you everything I got. Promise. You tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. Uh, Cadence, Cadence, Cadence. Yeah, Cadence is is super easy. Uh, live scope Cadence, I don't even want to talk about because it's basically watch the video game, make adjustments to the video game to make fish bite. It's that simple. Let's say you don't have uh, the video game set up, the panoptics. Are you trying to get a pure reaction strike from them? Are you like, let me rephrase that. What is the water temperature you're dealing with? And what species are you going after? If you're going after spotted bass on Gaston, Claytor Lake, uh, Lake Hartwell, places like that you can go a little bit faster cadence even in colder water to get them to bite if you're dealing with smallmouth generally generally speaking you can go with a harder rip now this is what's important my opinion by the way with them a jerk bait is a pure reaction bait the core feeding response you are getting from these fish is when that thing gets down in the zone and then it, it leaves if i am not trying to move this very fast and i'm just trying to slowly just reel it in why would I fish a jerk bait when I can fish the bait that's completely tangled? <laughs> when I could fish a spy bait, this thing is literally meant to be slowly wound through the water column and it just shimmies. This thing is meant to be jerked. If I want to slow roll something, instead of doing this, I'm just going to go with a spy bait. It makes my life way easier. Therefore, I'm going to use the jerk bait to, to rip. Now, my cadence is I'm going to start out fast and then I'm going to go slower it, because I can cover water quicker, period in a story. If the slow cadence, if I go through a hole and the slow cadence doesn't work, I've wasted a ton of time fishing that area. If I fish the fast cadence first and then go to the slow one, I didn't waste as much time. And that's how like my brain noodle works. So if I'm near the juice and I can, I bring that thing down there with a little bit faster cadence and I don't get bit right away. 
I'm going to switch and then go to that slow cadence to see what happens. Uh, I just feel like it's way more efficient for me to do it that way. So if you have two or three points, what I might do is I might hit those two or three points, do the fast cadence first, and then go back through there with that little bit slower cadence. Um, generally speaking, the cadence I'm going to go with is I'm going to get, I'm going to jerk it to get it down into the kill zone. And once I get it down there, it's going to be jerk, jerk, pause, jerk, jerk, slow twitch, jerk, jerk, something like that. Now, the more important thing, the cadence really to me is like how long you're giving it in between jerks. What I think is more important is how hard you rip it. So if you snap that thing on, on slack line, you're going to get that thing to dart pretty hard and it's not going to move very far, but it's going to, it's going to move hard. So if it's going from point A to point B, it's going to move pretty sporty with a good snap of that rod tip. What I want you to try to do though, in between your hard jerks is every now and then jerk, jerk, pause, and then just do a slow little twitch of, of, of your, of your rod tip, just a slow little twitch. We're going to get into that in a minute. Why? If you've ever fished a fluke in a pond, what does a large mouth, a spotted bass, and a small mouth have in common? And this is with any bait, they shark it. When you're fishing a jerk bait specifically, those fish are sharking that bait. They're somewhere, the ones that are going to eat, the ones that are so close to, to committing to that bait, they're going to be right there. Now, what will happen is a lot of times that hard jerk got their attention, they'll get up there. And they're going to be right there. What I want to do then, if that fish is just borderline right there and he hasn't committed to those hard jerks, every now and then I'm just going to give it that slow little pull and that slow little quiver, and then I'll go back to the jerking. This is my brain. This is how my brain works. I'm picturing I'm jerking that thing hard. I'm making that thing make its noise, its movement, its darting. That fish is following it, and for some reason he's not committing to that. Like, I, I want him to. Fine. Then every now and then with that fish there, I'm just going to give it a slow, just slow little pull of the rod hand, a slow little pull of the rod tip, almost like I'm pulling it just a little bit because I want that thing to jerk. It pauses, and it just moves just a little, just a little, and usually that'll get it to commit. And so that's just something I like to, I like to just mix in every now and then on my retrieve. It's the same thing with like if I'm fishing a spinnerbait mid-depth in the water column, I'll stop it or I'll jerk the rod tip because it'll make it pulse. I do that when I fish an umbrella rig too, is you'll jerk it a little bit and it'll make, it'll make the blades plume. And that's something a little different. So if I'm jerk, 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 and then every now and then I'll just pull with the rod tip just a little bit just to make it just, just quiver. And that usually will turn a follower into a biter. So I hope that, I hope that kind of helps with you. Cadence is a hard thing because there's no set cadence to work. That's like saying like, you know, what's your favorite color to wear? Like on a Tuesday of every month, like everyone has their own opinion on that. Let's get back to this. Jesse, my buddy loves the Uzuris. Yeah, I need, I, I made a list of it. I'm definitely going to add that to the thing. Add that to my list of things to do. Greg, it's a solid tip. Thank you, sir. Let's see. Uh, you just said lipless will outfish chatterbaits and then left me hanging. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Greg. Yeah, they will. I will do, I don't have any of my lipless crankbaits here at all. So tell you what, if you guys want me to do a pure in-depth lipless crankbait seminar, um, I'll go down the rabbit hole with that. Press F in the chat if you want me to do a lipless crankbait seminar, just with what I think works on the um, the tidal Potomac and any grass fishery with submergent vegetation. I'll get into that because uh, I love me some lipless baits. Absolutely. Just like press F in the chat if that's something you want. Let's get through this. So much wasted. Let's see, Greg. Uh, so much time wasted dead sticking. Yeah, and again, it's like... I get the idea of dead sticking it every now and then to try it. But the thing with a dead sticking approach with, with anything, and let's say you're, um, you're soaking a tube, you're soaking a jig, you're soaking a jerk bait. You have got to know that that place has fish first and foremost, before you start doing the dead sticking approach. Cause if it does not work, you are wasting so much time. It's the same thing where if, if I'm fishing my big swim baits in the winter time and I have to slowly painfully drag that thing and I'm just working it around the, the, the bottom of the lake. If I don't feel like this is a high percentage area, I just wasted, you know, 10 to 20 minutes fishing that one area. Or I could try to get them to react. Again, not going back to it with tactical bassing, Matt Allen, you know, they have a speed cranking setup that they swear by and they've caught big fish where they're burning crankbaits in really cold water. Because the idea is you're trying to get that core feed reaction strike. Um, and I really think, generally speaking, a reaction bite is way 
easier to get, and you're gonna have more success than going with that pure feed response. The pure feed response generally only works on the biggest bass in the body of water, period. And I'm talking the guys that are gonna eat trout, the 10 pounders, 16, seven, you know, those type of fish, those are the ones that don't eat very much. And when they eat, it's not gonna be reaction based, it's gonna be pure feed based. If your goal is to catch the biggest fish in, let's say, the Shenandoah River, maybe that dead that dead drift technique will work for you. However, there's also a chance if you're in a tournament, you might only catch one fish. And so that's kind of be where your mindset at also is if you're fishing a tournament and you got to catch five, that dead drift might not be the best technique. Here we go. F, F. Okay, we got three people. We got Greg, Jeff, and Jess all want the lipless crankbait seminar. Uh, got a couple more people that wanted to. Yep. So guys, we will do a lipless crankbait seminar. Hold me to that. When we get a little bit closer to, um, lipless crankbait time, we'll do that. Let's see if you are fishing with a partner, mixing the cadence up can double the efficiency. Absolutely. Uh, when my, my brother and I would fish tournaments, uh, all the time, actually, I'll bring this up for you guys too. see if I can find the video. Uh, we mix up the cadence, but we, we go, we go super, super in depth when we fish a jerk bait tournament together. Um, it, cause you can dial in stuff so good with a jerk bait bite. When you have two people in the boat, it'll absolutely make your head spin. Let me get up some footage here to kind of show you guys. This pops up on my old screen screen here. Um, I'm going to show you exactly what my brother and I do. Cause it's actually pretty insightful about how we actually fish. If the internet is going to work for me today. Because that's always a fun. Th oh, there we go. Sweet. We got it to work. All right. Let's go with Kiwi, 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 Kiwi. Where are you? All right. So this is a Kiwi. We're doing some practice for a tournament. So right here. All right. This is where I want to go. So right here, we're fishing. We're, we're doing a jerkbait pattern. All right. We are fishing steep bluff walls. This is we're pre-fishing. I think this is January that we're there pre-fishing for that. I am at closest to the bank, and what I was fishing at the time, I actually still have this bait on me. It is a, and this this lake has blueback in it. I was fishing a blueback, and this one is made by Rapala. This is a blueback deep diving bait. I was fishing, and you can tell me I'm taking the hooks off. I was fishing the exact same bait, but I was fishing a shallower diver bait. Same color, because they were dialed into the blueback, but we're fishing two different depths. So let me pull that back up for you. So I am closest to the bank. So I'm sitting there again for the people that just joined since we had a bunch of people who just joined. And again, guys, if you could just like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, that really helps me out with the algorithm. It helps us grow. And so we can have bigger and better things. I'm closest to shore. I'm fishing the blueback herring Rapala jerkbait shallow diver. My brother is farther on that drop off and I have the boat positioned. So it's right on the drop off. So he's fishing there and he's fishing the deeper diving Rapala. And us just going down the bank like that, we were so efficient in covering water and finding those specific key areas that the fish were holding on. And, it, and this is before like live scope was a thing. And as you can tell right here, boom, he catches one. Right on that tip of that, that breaking point. And that was just something that we learned by fishing so long together that you can maximize your time by positioning you and the, you and the boat right where you need to be. So I really hope that kind of helped there with, with like boat positioning with, with team tournaments, get both in the boat, get you guys up there in the front. You can work two different depths of the water column. You can, you can trade off two different colors at the same time. It really, really is efficient. Uh, let's see. There was something else that we were supposed to talk about. We were supposed to talk about cadence. Let me think about water was 36 degrees. Yeah. The water was bone cold. It was super bone cold the other day, Greg, but you can still catch them on that. The other thing you can do is if you're fishing those areas and that jerk bait bite goes away, you go to the spy bait. You've tried the spy bait, go to a blade bait. Hey, now I made a joke with this the other day when I was, when I was fishing, the problem with blade baits is they really are. You're going to lose a shit ton of them. Like, it's just the one thing that's guaranteed with these things is you will lose them. Uh, the one I, I absolutely adore is the Demiki vault. I really love that. I love that you're able to actually change the positioning of the head with this thing. But again, like as you can tell with all these baits, besides maybe a, a little hair jig or a, or a power Ned rig in the winter time, generally speaking, I'm throwing reaction style baits. Uh, the Demiki Greg is fantastic. I actually, I smoked a bunch of small mouth with this when I went, went out with Jeff green. Um, I have hooked massive large mouth with this thing. We went down, my brother and I went down to Lake Okeechobee about four years ago. I think it was. 
And it was when, uh, when they had that absolute, just terrible cold snap um, and everything froze and the fish shut off. We pulled out to, uh, blade baits and we started to kill them again in the canal systems there. It's a way that you can get bit no matter what. It's fantastic. They work. People don't like to throw them. I really think the reason they don't like to throw them is the fact that they are super snaggy. And then here's my tip. You want to throw these on pure braid, throw them on 30 pound braided line on a spinning gear outfit. Why? Spinning gear, it's going to have the maximum sensitivity. You're going to be able to drop it right back down. And that's going to come into importance when you are fishing smallmouth, particularly because I've had them in 30 degree water. You finish your cast and you reel that blade in and the fish are torpedoing off the bottom to go get them. Yeah. Well, so Greg, it's not that like, I, I personally thought like I'm going to use blades in Florida. It's just like, I packed all the shit in the boat <laughs> and I just kept it there. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the synopsis of that story. I, I usually keep everything in the boat when it's go time just in case. And then I had a couple of blades lying around it. And again, Oh, and if you don't have blades, just use a, uh, a lipless bait. You can use a lipless blade, a one knocker, booyah, one knocker. You can make a one knocker or something like that. That'll work extremely well as well. Um, again, guys, like, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps the algorithm. Yeah. Tamiki vaults are really good. Silver, sexy shad or pure white, pure white can absolutely kill them. Uh, the reason you want to go with the heavy braid is you want to get soft treble hooks, soft metal treble hooks that'll bend and break easily. Why? So if you hook a rock or something at the bottom, the hook will bend out or snap and you'll get your bait back. Um, you can take a plug knocker. I'm not saying you can't, but in case the plug knocker doesn't work either, you can use this and just rip it out and you get your blade back and you save a little bit of money there. Uh, Jess, I have a fun question. When was the last time you have used live crayfish as bait? It's probably been 15 years for me. Yeah, it's been insanely long since I've used crayfish. Um, I've never even used helgramites before. Uh, I have used minnows. Uh, uh, Burke Lake back in the day, we'd use minnows to catch crappie and stuff, which was a lot of fun. But that's something I want to do is a live bait episode, uh, floating for walleye or things like that. I think that would be so much fun to do. Cut one, uh, cut one hook on front treble. Uh, you can, yeah, cut one hook. The other thing you can do too is just put a blade on the front. And so what you can do is put an oversized hook on the back and put a blade on the front and just have no hook. And that a lot of times will, will, will work extremely well because what will happen is a small mouth particularly will come up and eat the blade on the front of the bait and you can still grab him with this back hook. Uh, now, this is super important if you are going to do the blade trick. If you are going to do the blade trick, I highly recommend you put it on the front. Do not put it on the back. The jackal, which is another bait I absolutely adore. The 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 jackal, I don't know. I think it's the jackal. Is the jackal blade is the name of it? I gotta like again. I gotta pull this out. I'll, I'll link this in the episode description. But the, yeah, I think it's the jackal blade. It has a blade on the back. I love that for smallmouth. By the way, a, a, a bladed uh, blade, a, a bladed blade bait. I love that for smallmouth. But with that one on the back, I get a ton of fish that will bite the back blade and won't come, they won't get buttoned. If you put a blade on the front and you rip that thing, when they go to commit to the head of that bait, you can still get them with the back of the hook. So that's a good little tw uh, little mix up that you can do, which will work extremely well. Try that. But Greg, yeah, cutting off the front trouble, like the, the front part of the trouble will actually help a lot. Bradley, interesting. No, thank you. Yeah, it is. It is a fishing podcast, sir. Uh, I hope you had a fantastic Christmas and a happy holidays. I have not talked to you actually in person in about four weeks, it feels like. So I, I'm glad that you're still alive and, and working hard. Oh, let's see. There was another question. Like, hi, Lee. Glad you're doing well, my good sir. Cannot wait for the kayak season to get back. Hopefully this time I'll, I'll not lose any of my stuff like I did last year. No, blade baits, guys, you, you got to be throwing them this winter time. They absolutely just absolutely kill them this time of year on the old blady baits. Let's sure. Where is that one? I, think, I know it's Demiki. It's good. No, it's, I mean, it's got to be Jackal. I know it's Jackal. Or is it the Sixth Sense? Oh, okay. Oh, you got the Demiki Vault Spinner. That's pretty cool. I got to show you guys what I'm, I'm saying here. You got the, I got so many blades. I know it's like, it's made by Jackal. I know because it was at it was at it was at Jake's bait and tackle. There it is. Found it. So it's, it's the oh, are you getting rid of these things? 
You better not be getting rid of these things. What the hell happened to it? It just disappeared. I hate it when that happens. There it is. So the the Jackal D Croup Tail Spinner. That's now that's not the one I have. One I have. I know it's in stock. Where is it? There it is. It's the sexy sad. That one right there. That one's really freaking good. I know I have another version of that too that actually works really well. Where the hell is it? Where's the Mega Bass version? This one's extremely good too. Again, and I, you can also cut down the blade side, which helps a lot as well. Carl Colo, how deep, how deep should I be fishing? I can only find 10 to 13 feet of water. If that is the deepest portion of the body of water you're fishing, then that's a good place to start. Um, so I, I give me a little bit more intel, sir, about like, are you talking about, is it a pond? Is it a lake? Is it a river? Is it your swimming pool? Uh, yeah, give me a little bit more vibe that I can, so I can help you out. But yeah, if it's 10 to 13 feet of water, that's a pretty good area to be, be throwing. If it's a pond, definitely go with a small uh, swim bait, like a 2.8 inch Kai tech on a ball head jig that can work extremely effective. Um, let's see, uh, brew tank outdoors. What do you throw the blade bait on setup wise? So blade bait wise, what I suggest you throw it on is get yourself a spinning rod set up medium, he medium, heavy, perfectly fine braid. I would say 30 pound braid is not bad. Then you're going to be throwing this bad boy right on that. If you want, you can change out your hooks to a soft wire treble. Um, we did Greg Plank had a very, very, uh, fantastic observation that I completely spaced on cut the front, the front treble, just one of the front treble hooks off. And then you can take this thing here. If you're casting it out and move this to the back. So if you take this and move it to the back, you'll be able to pull this without it getting stuck. So on a Domeki vault, there are three holes. Move it to the back one if you're going to cast and retrieve, because that way when you pull it, it's going to keep this hook from getting snagged. If it's on the very front one and you pull it, it's going to pull more up and these hooks are going to get caught. So hopefully that helps. And then a big thing, bud, if you're going to be throwing that blade bait, short little pulls. The reason I don't like to throw this on monofilament or fluorocarbon, I want super maximum sensitivity on this thing. Absolutely as sensitive as humanly possible. So I can snake this thing through all the bottom structure. And as soon as I feel this thing start to, to vibrate, I stop and get it back down. In a perfect world, you are hopping this thing off the bottom by an inch to two inches. That's literally all I want is an inch to two inches. I want this off the bottom. But if I'm fishing a mushy rod and monofilament, for example, and I rip that thing all the way like a foot and a half off the bottom, I'm going to lose a lot of those fish. You want that thing to hop really short so that fish that's, that's nosing it right there, every now and then you're going to hop it and he's going to inhale it and you're going to have him. The other important thing when you're fishing that blade bait with that rod, let me see if I can do this without destroying stuff. Okay. I am not going to fish that rod up like this at 12 o'clock. The reason is if I'm hopping with that rod super duper high up over my head like this and I get, I actually hook one. I have no more room to go with that rod. You always want to fish a blade bait with that rod down almost at a, a neutral to water level position. So you can slowly hop it like this. So when you do get bit, you can go from here, which I guess is like 12, one, two, three, four. So at that four or five o'clock part right there, and you can pull all the way back and you have all this room to actually set the hook and reel it in. That's something I learned the hard way when I would fish these blade baits is I'd keep the rod tip way too high, like I was fishing a jig or a shaky head, thinking I was going to reel down and set the hook. You're not. You're just pulling tight on it. And if you keep that rod tip super high, you have nowhere else to go, and you're going to lose a lot of fish with that thing. So make sure you keep the rod tip down. Again, this is why braid's so important. There's no stretch. You get that thing to activate very quickly. Real pulse, real pulse. And when you get bit, you can reel tight and pull it up the rest of the way. So uh, brew tank outdoors, I really hope that helps. Uh, I tuned in at the end of the jerkbait conversation, so maybe I miss it, but what do you use for a jerkbait rod? Okay, Ben, uh, jerkbait rod. You can use a medium, a medium heavy spinning rod outfit, your choice. You can use 10 to 14 pound braid as your main line and then go with a really anywhere between eight to 10 pound test fluorocarbon is really the industry standard for like jerkbait fishing around there. Now, if you are fishing around docks, if you're casting it close to brush piles, lay down trees, let's say you're on the river and you're fishing down the side of the river and there's a huge lay down in a deep pool and you want to get that jerkbait as close as possible, 
and precision is more important than casting distance, I suggest going to a bait caster setup, a medium to a medium light bait casting rod. And then you can spool that up with eight pound test to 10 pound test fluorocarbon, especially in cold water. Now, if you are fishing a jerk bait in let's say spring or summertime, which again, please throw a jerk bait year round, go up to heavier line. The fish are going to fight a little bit harder. And let's say you're fishing, let's say Smith mountain Lake in April or may, and you're catching five to six pound largemouth. I would suggest going up to 12 pound fluorocarbon, maybe a bait caster setup. So you have a little bit more control of those fish and you can get them in the boat. But if you're fishing, let's say the Shenandoah river right now and the water's 30 degrees, you know, eight pound test is, is going to be fine. You're going to be able to get those fish in. They're not going to jump. You're going to be able to control them without a problem. So I hope that helped. And again, guys, I'll be re-uploading this tomorrow. So if you miss anything, don't worry. You can go back and rewatch it and get all the information. So Ben, I really hope that helps. Uh, Chris, that what that short you released about the tragic event when you lost all that gear, super unlucky. It w it hurt to watch. Oh my God, that was so fun. Yeah. So uh, I was fishing a, I think it was my first kayak tournament on the Shenandoah River. And I lost a, a $300 rod in real combo. I broke the rod on the hook set, lost the fish. I put the spinning rod back in the holster. And then I grabbed the kayak, uh, the paddle. And as I unhooked the kayak paddle, the paddle actually hit the reel and knocked it into the drink. It was, oh, it was so depressing. Good God, that was depressing. Um Chris, I know exactly. Yeah, that one hurt a lot, but I learned a lot that you actually do need straps when you're actually fishing it. it it's very helpful to actually have straps. So, yep, that's uh, guys. Yeah, I mean, that that was the jerkbait fishing in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, if, please let me know if you have any questions down below so I can answer them here. Uh, let me see. I do have a couple of housekeeping things I'm going to get to and then we can be on our way. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Fluorocarbon hooks, change the hooks out. That's very important. Color wise. I'll put that in the episode description when I relaunch it. Size wise, that's something else I don't think we covered for smallmouth bass. Going to that smaller bait is super important. Um, you know, if you got go a mega bass, go with a mega bass, uh, junior 110, that really works. The mega bass X80 TD trick darters, another really good one. Um, you know, this one right here, this is a, this is a trout magnet jerk bait. This is gold. This one is two and a half inches long. This is a super nice one. You can get it in different colors. Uh, let's see, see, we got another comment right here. We got CJ eight Ted boat spot, boat spot locked when blade baiting and casting to the sides of the boat river fishing on the Susky. Yeah. A hundred percent dude. Uh, blade baiting when you're, when you're throwing that thing, I definitely want to throw the sides of the boat. If, if possible, you want to throw to the sides. You don't want to be throwing, bombing it straight upstream because you're going to get snagged a lot by doing that. Oh, you know what, sir? You brought up a very interesting point. When you're throwing the blade bait, get the heaviest one you can get away with. The reason you want it heavy and current is so it drops straight down and you keep contact with it. If you're fishing a one fourth ounce blade bait on the upper Potomac or the Susquehanna, and the current hits that thing and blows it, that's when you're going to get snagged. You want that thing to be super heavy. And so when it hits the bottom and you pick it up, it's not going to get blown as much. That's very important. That's one little tip and trick for this. The other thing that's nice about that too is it'll go back to the bottom pretty quickly. And it's a lot easier to keep it in short hopping motions with it. Um, you know, I really, really hope that helped. Let's see if we've got any other questions there. No, nah, I mean, like jerkbait fishing is like so much fun and I, and I really love it. But then mixing it up with the spy bait, you know, throwing, keeping a couple of spy baits in your box when the, when the jerkbait bite dies, keeping a blade bait here. Like, and what's funny is people would be like, well, Tom, why are you talking about these other two things with the jerkbait? This is supposed to be a pure jerkbait seminar. To me, it's like the jerkbait is like that holy grail that's in the center of wintertime fishing for a lot of folks. But then the spokes of this wheel are going to be your spy bait and your blade bait. So when the jerkbait bite dies, usually you're still around the fish. And, and usually a jerkbait bite will die in the same day that you're fishing for it. And that is why I think keeping a blade bait and a spy bait around is so freaking important. Keep those around, use those. And I think you're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, and any other questions about that stuff that I can answer, please let me know right now before I kind of be cycling off here. I'm going to be reading through, let me read through real quick, make sure I got everybody. Let's see. Comments. What are some mega bass jerk baits? Let's see, Bob. I think I already got this question. What are some mega bass jerk bait colors that you like to use? Um, 
a mega bass anything bone the bone color is very important translucent you want silver and then you want gold if you have those colors there you're going to be absolutely fine and get that fast attached swivel fast attached swivel is super duper important um guys tomorrow i'll be re-uploading this next week we have a brand new podcast episode we're gonna be talking about lake anna in the wintertime, which will be a lot of fun and then we also have a hidden gems episode that is going to be coming out shortly a new hidden gems episode i've been working on that for a while so hopefully you guys will enjoy that let me get that up right here and we can kind of uh I can show you that one. Let me remove that real quick. Present. And then here's a little sneak peek of that. We are, I have a Hidden Gems walleye session. I actually got, went out with Kingfisher Guide Service. We we actually shot an episode. We did some winter smallmouth fishing, specifically trying to target walleye. We ended up catching absolutely a monster walleye. Uh, we'll be getting into that story as well, as also talking about the Shenandoah in of itself. So that's going to be an absolute fun, fun episode. That's going to be airing later this week. Um, I'm hopefully going to have this out later this week. So it, it was, it was an absolute blast to be out with him. And I taught him a lot. He taught me a lot about the river. And I also taught him a lot about the spy bait and the blade bait. Um, it was fun. He caught a really nice smallmouth. I caught a couple of nice ones too, with some tips and tricks there with the Ned rig that I used Uh spoiler. I put a blade on a Ned rig. Yeah. I put a blade on a Ned rig and I absolutely caught a monster smallmouth doing that. And then, of course, we did the jerkbait bite, but it was all in the hunt for a big walleye. And we finally caught a walleye that was that was pretty nice. It, it was well over, you know, five, six pounds, which for me, that's the biggest walleye I've ever caught in my life. And that was a lot of fun. So that episode is going to be debuting hopefully here shortly. Uh, going to do the best I can to edit it all together. Uh, let's see. Please share Augusta County Fishing and Outdoor Expo in Virginia, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Augusta County Fishing and Outdoor Expo in Virginia. There you go. Uh, yeah. Like if you want to give me a uh, Doug, if you want to give me some information, I can post it on my Facebook as well. Uh, if you would like, so just send me a message on Instagram or Facebook and I can reshare that on my social media. If, if that would help you out too. Uh, again, guys, the last thing of the evening, Richmond expo, we will be live streaming from the Richmond expo all the time, like all the time, all three days of the Richmond expo. We will be live streaming from it. We'll be giving you content, including podcast ghosts and podcast guests. And we'll be going from booth to booth. As you can tell, I am exhausted, and that is why I'm now slowing my words together. My apologies for that. Guys, please let me know in the episode description, and then message me somewhere and let me know some topics for our next show. I love doing these little seminars. We have so many guests coming on the show this wintertime. I'm super excited for it. I got a bunch more fun stuff to announce later later this month. January is going to be the time of announcements of fun, cool things that are going to happen. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. And I will see you guys uh, on the next show. Definitely. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.